Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Ashok Leyland Q3 FI23 conference call hosted by Access Capital Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen-only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star and then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Nishit Jalan. Thank you, and over to you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, Q3 FI23 uh, Post Results Conference Call of Ashok Leyland. From the management team, we have with us uh, Mr. Dheeraj Hinduja, Executive Chairman, uh, Mr. Shenu Agarwal, Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer, and Mr. Gopal Mahadevan, Director and Chief Financial Officer. I'll now hand over the call to uh, Mr. Hinduja uh, for his opening remarks, uh, post which uh, we can move to Q&A. Over to you, Mr. Hinduja. Thank you. Uh, good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me immense pleasure to be in touch with you, and I thank you very much for the interest shown in Ashok Leyland. I will quickly run you through the Q3 performance as well as some of the latest developments. I'm extremely happy to share that Q3 FY23 continued to be good, aided by strong performance in domestic truck sales with 32.6% market share. This is almost a 7.3% increase over our market share during the same period last year. This is the fourth consecutive quarter of 30% plus market share for Ashok Leyland. In Q3, MSCV truck volumes have grown more than 1.3 times than the industry growth, resulting in AL market share improving to 32.6% as compared to 25.3 in Q3 of last year. EBITDA for Q3 was at rupees 797 crores, 8.8%, as against rupees 224 crores, 4% in Q3 of last year. Our LCB volumes in Q3 are higher than last year by 15%. Q3 domestic after sales at 507 crores grew at 28% over the same period of last year. Q3 operating profit was at rupees 560 crores as against the loss of rupees 15 crores in Q3 of last year. Working capital has reduced by about rupees 135 crores during the quarter, capital expenditure for the quarter was at around 100 crore. Our profits during the quarter have helped with the reduction of net debt by about 635 crore. Debt equity is at 0.3 times versus 0.4 times during the same period last year. During the quarter, we have launched Partner Super in 9, 10, and 11 tons, Oyster White CNG, Oyster White Diesel Double Door, 13.5 meter bus with drum brakes, Lynx Smart Stuff Bus Chassis, and expanding our range further with new products. I'm extremely confident that with these launches and the continued expansion of the network, we will sustain the market share gains achieved in the last four quarters. The growth in MSCV trucks, TIV in Q3, and LCV trucks is backed by recovery in macroeconomic environment, replacement demand and pickup in infrastructure, mining and construction activities. Healthy growth in the end user industries like cement, steel and infrastructure, as well as increase in general manufacturing activity and consumption trends continue to support demand from fleet operators. Supported by these factors, the industry volumes are inching towards the previous peak registered in FY19. The viability of fleet operators is expected to continue to remain healthy despite some moderation in freight rates post the festive season. For FY23, the industry volumes are expected to grow at a healthy rate supported by steady freight demand and economic recovery. The government's focus on infrastructure spending and boom in e-commerce are further uh, supporters of this growth. However, inflation concerns driven by hike in interest rates and continued high fuel prices and its impact on viability of fleet operators 
would have to be monitored in the near future. We are very encouraged by the resumption in the MSCB passenger segment, which reported a year-on-year -year growth of 132%, supported by almost full resumption of offices and educational institutions. However, the volumes are yet to reach the pre-pandemic levels of 10, 12,000 per quarter. LCV year-on-year -year growth of 5% is supported by healthy demand from agriculture and allied sectors. The increased last mile transportation requirements, especially from e-commerce and stable macroeconomic environments. While the pace of growth is slowing down as the base effect catches up, the volumes have already surpassed the quarterly levels reported in FY 2018 and FY 2020 levels and are close to industry high seen in FY 2019. The softening of commodity prices, in particular steel, has, in, has impacted on the margins positively. Ashok Leyland, even while growing market share sequentially, has been raising prices owing to higher input costs. What is good to see is that the retention of such increases is better. LCV, both Dost and Barados are gaining inroads and have been growing stronger by the day. Both these products hold immense potential for exports and are a perfect fit in our addressable market. Aftermarket also continues to perform very well. We are putting uh, tremendous efforts in reducing costs, both product costs as well as overhead. I know there has been a lot of interest in SWITCH, which is an important initiative, and we are committed to developing SWITCH as a global electric vehicle company. We have established a name and a platform as a credible EV manufacturer. Our sales order pipeline is robust. We are choking out our plans to utilize growth opportunities fully by placing high-quality, cost-effective products. After I have finished, I, I will ask Gopal to brief you further on the progress at SWITCH and the status with potential investors. Finally, before I open the floor to questions, let me share the financials in brief. Revenue for Q3 at Rs. 9,030 crores, which is 63% higher than Q3 of last year. Manpower cost in Q3 is higher than previous quarter by Rs. 30 crores due to variable performance pay and bonus provision restatements reflecting the current performance level. EBITDA is at rupees 797 crores, 8.8% in Q3, up from rupees 224 crores last year. Profit after tax after exceptionals for the quarter was at rupees 361 crores versus rupees 6 crores in Q3 of FY22. Operating working capital for Q3 was at rupees 355 crores as against rupees 490 crores as of September 22. Net debt was at 2,043 crores in December 22 as against 2,677 crores in September 2020. Uh, September 22. Debt equity at the end of the quarter was at 0.3 times. Capital expenditure for the quarter was at rupees 104 crores. Cumulative spend till 31st December 2022 was at 322 crores. CapEx spend for the full year is estimated to be at around 600 crores. So before we open the floor for questions, I would request Gopal to uh, brief you a little more on switch. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. So, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much for the interest in Ashok Leyland. Uh, just to very quickly brief on Switch, you know, I think the company is doing very well. Uh, all of you must have read about it. Uh, we just recently, the company recently has got a 2,100 uh, bus order uh, from CESL, um, you know, one of the largest orders uh, uh, which we have, uh, the, the industry has witnessed. And this has been followed through with another 500 bus order from the Telegram State Road Transport uh, Corporation. Of course, all of this would be finally some, uh, you know, some adjustments may happen in the volume when final rollout happens, but just a very large order, which is very material for the company and also for the industry. We can really see that the potential of EV is growing very fast in India. 
Uh, we are also kind of poised, this company is poised to launch a spectrum of exciting products. I think uh, the Double Decker, which was launched, uh, you know, last year, the end of last year, has created a lot of excitement. It has raised the bar on the industry in terms of uh, quality, fit, finish, and, uh, you know, total cost of ownership, and also the viability of Double Decker as a transportation EV alternative. Uh, Switch UK is also poised actually to launch the E1 bus sometime in the middle of um, the current uh, current middle middle of early part of uh, uh, next year or later part of this year, and we are also waiting. The whole industry is waiting for uh, the Bada Dos TV to be launched, which should happen somewhere in June or in the third quarter of the current year. So there's a lot of activity on the product development. Also, we have had uh, order bookings coming in. We are waiting. The Switch UK is waiting for the European markets to recover. As you know, there has been a lot of challenge on the European and the UK side. Uh, because of uh, um, uh, not only the economic turmoil, but also the impact of the war, etc. But we believe that once uh, you know this happens, we are going to see the potential of Switch UK also to kind of scale up uh, very quickly. Some of you would be keen to understand where we are. Uh, as we had discussed earlier, it is taking a little bit longer than expected, not because there is a uh, you know uh, in the lack of interest from investors into it, but we just want to ensure that we are getting the right strategic partners uh, who will kind of partner uh, switch and its management team in growth. Uh, there are uh, active discussions going on uh, with several investors, both for switch and for home, which is the e-mobility as a service uh, company that uh, has been structured. And we'll have more to update to you maybe in the you know in the coming quarter. We will keep you posted, but uh, business uh, is continuing, and uh, I think the leverage that uh, the switch team has been able to uh, obtain in getting orders on product development has actually been uh, very much on time. So back to you, Jan. Yes, thank you, Gopal. Uh, we'll be happy to take uh, your questions now. Thank you. We will now begin the question answer session. Participants who wish to ask a question may press star and one on your touchstone telephone. Participants who wish to ask a question may press star and one on your touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. We are the first question on the line of Jinesh Gandhi. So, Motilal as well, please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, congrats on good set of numbers. Uh, quickly, uh, if you can talk about the drivers of margin expansion in this quarter, um, how much would have been uh, contributed by commodity cost benefit, and is there any reduction in discounts which we are seeing? If you can talk uh, more about it. Uh, okay, let, uh, let me take a shot at this. Uh, you know, Dinesh, hi. Uh, essentially, we have seen a confluence of uh, factors to uh, drive uh, margin expansion. I, I would say there are four reasons for it. And I rightly observe you mentioned two, which are the most important ones or the critical ones. One is there has been uh, improvement in realization, and we have been consistently raising prices uh, over the last few quarters. We have done that even in the month of January, because we believe that uh, with the growing demand, uh, we also need to raise the prices because there has been a switch from BS4 uh, to BS6. And while metal prices are coming off, which is extremely positive for the industry, we also know that uh, there has been an increase in steel prices, which has happened over the last two, three years. So we, we continue to uh, kind of raise prices uh, uh, you know, as efficiently as possible. The second one is, again, as you mentioned, steel prices have come off uh, you know, quite sharply. And as Chairman had mentioned, our expectation is that they will continue to be at these levels or even a little softer in Q4, which will, uh, you know, kind of uh, help in uh, improving margins as we move forward. The third thing which has also improved is I mentioned four, and now I, you know, kind of explained two. The other two are the mix of the products. We've been continuously working on the mix to ensure that, you know, the higher profitable SKUs are being sold, and uh, this has helped. And finally, is the absolute volume itself. Uh, you know, we have seen uh, a, a significant improvement in market share. Uh, you know, just one year back in August 2021 or so, our market share was at about 18 and a half percent. We have scaled about 30 significantly about that uh, in the current quarter. Uh, and, uh, you know, we hope to kind of pursue growth as we move forward. 
This has been possible because of the exemplary performance of uh, the Avtar range of vehicles. The modular range of vehicles has uh, you know, been accepted very well in the market, and there is quite a bit of pull in certain segments uh, for Avtar vehicles. And uh, I think uh, in terms of uh, quality, cost, delivery, total cost of ownership, fit and finish, uh, uh, I think the Avtar range has actually proved itself. The light commercial vehicles have also been doing reasonably well. They say some, uh, you know, uh, some headwinds occasionally, but uh, they are on a growth trajectory. And all of this volume growth has also helped in the operating leverage, if you notice. Okay, okay. And uh, are we seeing uh, real moderation in discounts now? I mean, one of uh, the largest players has talked about moving towards the demand pull model. Uh, so are we seeing benefit of that on the ground now? I hope that the industry will, you know, given the fact that uh, this is a very unique industry where it is actually, uh, you know, there's so much of demand, it should actually be a, a seller's market, so to speak. But we've seen that there has been deals where getting one based on price, which was absolutely not necessary. We are seeing that discount levels are uh, coming off a bit. We are expecting that uh, you'd see a little more consolidation on that in the fourth quarter. Finally, Jinesh, as you know, and to all the other investors also who have joined on the call, what we do at Ashok Leyland is we monitor the net price realization. You know, so finally, what matters is what is the net delivered price to the company, and that has been improving month on month. Keep a sharp okay. focus on it. Because it's not enough just to grow, which is very important for us. Uh, it is not growth or profitability. It is growth and profitability. Okay, that's uh, good to know. Uh, secondly, uh, can you talk about uh, uh, transition towards BSX phase two? Uh, how do we plan to transit for that and the kind of price increase uh, we would need to take to pass on the cost? Well, I think the industry would, uh, is, uh, you know, the industry is expected to raise prices on OBD2 and different players have got different technologies. So we'll, uh, we will be, uh, you know, we would continue to uh, ensure that we are more than covering our costs and uh, recover the same. The actual kind of uh, numbers on the cost increase, we'll have to wait and watch. Like I mentioned, uh, Dinesh, you know, each of the industry players have got slightly different technologies. But uh, you can be this. The only thing that I can say at this moment, and uh, while one can't be 100% confident on this, but we are reasonably confident that we are not going to get impacted severely by the over two. Got it. And then last question is on the tax uh, rate. And uh, uh, do we plan to move to new tax regime uh, in FY24, or we will continue on the old tax regime? We'll have to study the finer points and details and then take a call. Uh, because, uh, you know, there has been, I think this has been a very good budget, very really positive for the industry infrastructure and also some rationalization that has happened on the tax structure. But we'll have more to share. Uh, you know, our guys, uh, you know, our tax pundits in the company are pouring uh, over the finer details. But at this point, we won't be able to share anything yet. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. I'll fall back in queue. Thank you. Participants are requested to kindly restrict your questions to two per participant. Participants are uh, requested to kindly restrict your questions to two per participant. We have the next question on the line of Kapil Singh from Nomura. Please go ahead. Hi, good afternoon, sir. Congrats on a great set of numbers. Uh, my first question is on demand. If you could share your outlook for 2024, uh, you mentioned about some of the positive catalysts as well as the risk. So on the balance, do you expect uh, like a double digit growth next year. And also for this OBD2 norms, um, is the last uh, is the last date 31st March for production or uh, this is the last date for registration? Uh, and do you expect any element of pre-buy? Okay. Uh, did you want to take the one on demand or? Sure, sure. Uh, well, I think, you know, we've seen a very strong recovery during this uh, current financial year. And based on all the uh, initiatives that we heard in the budget yesterday and the special focus on the capital expenditure and transportation, we do expect that this strong momentum to continue. Uh, in terms of quantifying it, I would say that, you know, depending on finally how the GDP growth rate moves, you know, our industry is very closely 
correlated with that. But uh, I think all indications are that it will continue to remain a very strong year next year as well. And, uh, uh, you know, Gopal, and, with, uh, with, yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, Kapil, on uh, OBD2, we'll have more to share possibly at, uh, closer to the end of uh, uh, the quarter, as I had mentioned, uh, you know, to Jinesh also. Uh, because uh, we need to get some clarity overall, but all I can tell you is that we are well positioned uh, in terms of the technology that we are currently offering, you know, in OBD, uh, that we would be able to kind of seamlessly move forward on that. Yeah, no, the question was also because, uh, you know, we all know prices will go up, we don't know to what extent, but, you know, normally that leads to a pre-buy, so that that's where the question was coming from. Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. I mean, the, the only point is, you know, one, I see the pure, my viewpoint is this, you know, while it's easy to say that, yeah, because that will be a free buy, uh, I, I don't think that that will be a huge driver in terms of, a, you know, change. Like, for example, if you notice in 2019-20, right, which was pre-COVID, the entire industry was expected to have a heavy free buy because of the implementation of PS6 from 1st of April. But we saw that quarter on quarter in 1920, actually, the demand was not going, even though the cost of the vehicles was supposed to go up quite significantly. Of course, unfortunately, after that, we had an immediate outbreak. I think what we're going to see is that if the prices that's going to be raised by the industry is going to be quite, uh, you know, material, uh, you could see some amount of pre-buy, but I'm sure that the whole, see, the best part of, uh, let me put it this way, the best part of this, uh, you know, this current uh, year's demand has been that this has been a, quite a pull from the customers. There's genuine demand on the ground. Uh, all industries are, you know, are doing well. There's huge amount of interest spent. So I think even if that continues, that would, uh, you know, be uh, this trajectory is sufficient uh, for posting a healthy growth in the current uh, quarter. You know, on top of it, if there is an uh, OBD2 pre-buy, well, that's uh, that's going to be positive. But I don't think we are planning for a material demand increase on because of OBD2, but we'll have to wait and watch. Yeah. And so, uh, second question is on margins. I just wanted to understand how do you think about evolution of margins? Uh, so you can probably throw light upon three areas. One is whether you expect further commodity benefit. Second is, uh, you know, on pricing. And third is on operating leverage because uh, we are seeing that uh, your other expenditure is not rising as much as the revenue growth now. So are most of the costs related to, say, travel or uh, A&T and all are already there or you expect uh, uh, R&D or other things, they are already there in the numbers now or do you expect any material increase there? So just how you think about these three buckets of costs as we head into uh, next year. I'll, I'll possibly give a you know a general view and then possibly uh, request uh, Chairman Oshino to add. You see, what we're doing in the company today is to drive operational efficiency across the company. We have been doing it over the last several years, of course. <clears throat> you know, we have had various programs in material cost reduction, overhead reduction, and all that. But what we're now trying to do is slightly larger, and this has been kind of... Uh, you know, kind of uh, disseminated to the operating teams itself. So there is a separate team that's looking at manufacturing planning and manufacturing cost, for instance. There's a separate team on VAV and, you know, product cost. <clears throat> the third one that is there is on sales realization itself. We are actually doing a detailed heat mapping of what's happening on the market, what are the realizations across the various markets, how can we keep to tweaking the mix and the distribution to look at improving the net price realization. I talked about realization. I've talked about distribution cost. I've talked about uh, margins. There are teams on overheads, but what we are trying to do is to use digital in a you know, more wholesome way to drive productivity and reduce costs, which does not add value either to the customer or to the vendor or to any of the people in the chain. So there's a lot of substitution of effort that is happening. Finally, we are also looking at productivity of people, and there's a lot of engagement that is happening at the ground level. You know, there's, there's a huge effort in actually ensuring that the whole team is working towards one goal and not giving any forward-looking statements, but our plan is to do three or four things. One, to get deeper penetration and grow the share of business in India. The second one is to ensure that the grow businesses, which is uh, LCV, uh, international, defense, power solutions, 
after market grow even at a faster rate so that you know this helps to devolatize the company and secondly also improve the margins as i told you the grow businesses have uh, significantly better margins than the main msc business and exports is going to be something that we are looking forward to because currently the international markets are very very choppy and they have not uh, you know uh, given us the opportunity for growth as we would like even though we have been growing in the middle eastern markets so this is going to be for us uh, very important and we would want to ensure that uh, we are also introducing very relevant and uh, you know uh, differentiated products as we move forward these need not be very large uh, operics but one thing that has happened to us you know uh, has been that the avatar range and the bada dost have done exceptionally well because these have been completely differentiated products that a shock leland has offered and uh, you know that has helped us so we will continue to look at the benefits of uh, better deeper penetration cost management and more importantly operating leverage uh, driving the profitability of the company as we move forward uh, thank you very much uh, uh, thanks for the detailed answer thank you we have the next question on the line of pramod kumar from ubs please go ahead yeah uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity and uh, uh, congratulations on a excellent set of operation number uh, uh dheeraj my f- question is on the demand side uh, you did mention about uh, segments like cement steel and infra which are doing well if you can just help us understand better uh, given that the data availability has got really uh, 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 good nowadays uh, if you can just help us understand where what is the split of demand the, for the for the for the first nine months for you in terms of broader end user uh, applications where these trucks are going and categories which are uh, uh, kind of performing better or categories which can still uh, come back in a good way like tipper and other categories which we haven't spoken about if you can just give us some more color about the demand uh, and end user demand and what are the sectors which you are kind of optimistic and what sectors can do better see yeah, i said mentioned to you okay. pramod i mean that will uh, it's quite a bit of detail but broadly let me tell you what's happening is that uh, one of the reasons why the industry profitability is also moving better is because we are seeing that uh, there is uh, well, you know the demand has increased quite significantly in comparison to the other sectors in multi axle vehicle in uh, you know in the tractor trailers and in tipers these are the more profitable fuel the second one that is happening is the demand is also going for the larger tonnage so that is why we are seeing that the vehicles that are getting sold are the 40 tonners and 49 tonners so that becomes you know that drives the that's why i mentioned earlier that this helps in uh, you know this helps in uh, the uh, the profitability of the industry getting better icbs are important for us as a company as well and as a segment as well we have been gaining uh, you know growth and share in the icb segment but obviously you know the icb segment is uh, uh, you know lesser contributing than uh, the heavy uh, commercial vehicle now the the other point is with respect to sectors i think almost all significant uh, you know all significant uh, transport uh, i would say inducing sectors are doing well real estate has again continues even in the new budget i think with the impetus that has been given you would see real estate grow real estate is very very important uh, for you know the transportation is very crucial for this infra the government continues to kind of pursue on infrastructure uh an investment as a growth uh, trajectory for the economy itself and uh, we are also seeing that almost all industries are posting good growth you know so the, if you look at the core sectors if you look at uh, cement steel uh, uh so chemicals all of these sectors are paper all of these are doing very well the other bit that is doing well where uh, you know we are seeing some uh, bit of uh, icv is of course e-commerce i think there has been a lot of change in demand patterns especially after covid you're seeing that e-commerce is now you know become uh, very crucial uh, for the average uh, consumer and even you know what is happening is it is not only this there is also optimization of uh, logistics that is being looked at so today the focus has become that we need uh, trucks which will perform which will deliver on time which will reduce the total cost of ownership so why i am mentioning this is we could possibly see a trend where the replacement cycle of some of the ds2 ds3 trucks which are there or even to a certain extent ds4 would actually start happening faster because 
Today, it is not about just having wheels on the road. It's about getting things on time, point to point, and all organizations are becoming very, very efficient in their inventory management. So uh, we see a whole host of opportunities coming in. But at the end of all of this, what is most important is the economy has to grow. You know, that is where I think India scores, and possibly we'll see industry growing over the next maybe two years at least, going by the global forecasts. Fair enough. Uh, and uh, Gopal, and one uh, point to add yeah. to that, yeah. equally yeah. on the passenger side, as you will see, there is growth coming in in all areas, right from staff transportation to schools, and also uh, huge growth in the electric vehicle buses as well, as you heard from Switch. So across the board, all the segments are showing a very strong recovery. That, that's right, Chairman. Actually, I missed on the passenger side completely. I think that's going to show, as you mentioned, a faster growth because, uh, you know, we are we quite far from the peak volumes uh, that we have had. That's a very good point. Yeah, and, and just a follow-up on that, on the utilization side, Gopal, because uh, there are factors uh, which are headwinds for the sector, like uh, rising interest rates, uh, moderating growth rate, uh, but despite that, the industry has really surprised everyone on the monthly uh, velocity in terms of the volumes what are uh, what are getting added and and it, it you one cannot forget the fact that the tonnage uh, addition is significantly higher than the previous cycle because the average size of trucks have gone larger so uh, uh, given all that uh, what is the feedback you're getting from the end users like uh, if you have to get confidence on next year being a good growth year uh, uh, utilization of the fleet will also be very important and and hence the uh, replacement cycle or whatever con contractual or regulatory uh, 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 new purchase of new trucks how are you looking at utilization level at, say, uh, uh, different categories? And haulage is something which I think you did not mention in a positive light. So is that category still not doing that great, haulage? No, no, no. I mentioned haulage also. I said okay. that what is happening, I, I did mention haulage also. That uh, That's also another sector that's going. I said all the large trucks are doing well, and so is the small, uh, ICV. But the, the pull from the, from the larger trucks, especially in tippers, haulage, uh, and uh, I had uh, mentioned tractor trailers, all three. You know, that has actually also improved the profitability. See, as far as uh, next year is concerned, as we had mentioned, at the moment, we uh, see the overall, uh, all of you and all of us are confident that next year is also going to be growth year. And given the forecast of uh, the GDP, uh, which we have recently got, uh, not only for the current year, for the next year as well, uh, we don't see any logical reason why the demand for trucks should come off, you know, because there is nothing unusual that has happened. In the past, you must remember that, you know, we have had a lot of uh, shocks uh, or I would say sudden developments like an axle load norm coming in or, uh, you know, suddenly GST getting introduced or, uh, you know, other factors, NDFC crisis coming in, which had actually resulted in temporary contraction, but axle load had a much larger uh, impact. Yeah. Today, what we are seeing is, as Chairman had mentioned, one is, you know, we, we have not yet fully seen the demand of buses coming back because the impact of COVID is just waning, and we are actually seeing people having getting pulled back up into offices, schools, intercity transport is going to become crucial, and uh, also STUs would want to place orders. And now, again, as uh, Chairman had mentioned, we are not only going to see demand uh, possibly in uh, internal combustion, but also EV. That is, uh, that is why for us, switch is very, very important. Switch is not a, it's not a portfolio. It is for uh, you know, ensuring that the show clearance is future ready. The third bit is uh, if the economy is going to grow and we're going to see growth uh, happening in all the major sectors, including the sectors that impact it, there is no reason for us not to plan for growth. Because, you know, it's not just about hoping for growth. We, oh, there's a, this, is a, this is a very complex industry. We need to plan for it also. Thanks a lot. Uh, and wish you guys all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Participants are requested to kindly restrict your questions to two per participant. We have the next question from the line of Raghunathan from MK Global. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir, for the opportunity. Congratulations, team, on very strong numbers and uh, welcoming uh, Shenu, sir, on the platform. Uh, my first question, uh, Ashok has been doing very well on market share, favorable mix, uh, network expansion, new products uh, have been supporting factors. Can you share your thoughts on how you see the sustenance of market share ahead? 
Dhiraj, uh, you want to take it? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, you know, the last few quarters, we have uh, gradually been increasing our market share and it's been an all-round effort right from the product itself, which are performing very well, as Gopal was just explaining, and at the same time, the network expansion. Geographically, you would see the growth is happening across the board, across the country, and we've been able to increase our market share in uh, every zone that we're operating in and every segment as well. Going forward, uh, I would say that our aspiration is very much to continue this growth and as I think something I've said earlier as well, but to continue this growth on a profitable basis, we're not looking to buy market share. We want to do this through our better product performance and our customer care and service. So we do, uh, as we are looking forward to continuing our growth in market share. Got it, sir. Good luck with that. Uh, and specifically coming to Q3 revenue performance, uh, uh, can you also indicate uh, uh, how was the performance in the non-vehicle side of business? In press release, you have alluded to aftermarket and power solutions business doing well. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, the aftermarket has done well. I mean, well, you know, while we don't get specific breakdowns on this, uh, it has been growing at about 20-25% as well. And uh, Power solutions and uh, absolute terms for Q3 has been flattish, but on a YTD basis, if my memory serves me right, they have posted nearly about 18 or 19 percent growth. So, you know, the uh, it's uh, I think these are very important business for us. Like we said, defense business has uh, you know seen some bit of uh, I would say challenge now because of the ordering. It's got nothing to do with the business, but I think what's uh, you know we're waiting for the government orders to happen. Uh, especially on the kids' side, so we'll have more to share with you in the later part. I mean, later part of this year. But otherwise, and exports is also in you know YTD terms is uh, grown. Uh, last year itself, it had grown from uh, you know that it had grown by about 30, 40 percent to 11,000 units from the previous year of 8,000. We are certainly expecting the growth uh, in the current year as well. But we're waiting for the markets to kind of open up, international markets to open up, because there is a lot of you know, uncertainty in the international waters currently. But uh, having said that, the international team is also, you know, kind of uh, chalked out its plan pretty clearly. Uh, there are teams now specifically looking at project orders, and there are teams which are looking at uh, retail distribution. So, you know, in countries like Africa, while it's a little too early to share those developments, what we have been looking at is how do we get a network in place uh, how do we get the financing in place, which is going to be important not only for the dealer but for the end customer as well? But the, you possibly would see that you know the export volumes, if things start to return to normalcy uh, in the international markets, you would possibly see that our export volumes will start to gain momentum. Uh, thank you for that, sir. Uh, just lastly, can you indicate uh, what is the kind of investments you expect for 23 and 24? Uh, again, I, we will have to, you know, we, it's, it's, you know, we are having a budgeting season now, so it's a little too early to uh, uh, share what next year's capex will be. All that I can give you as an indicator is, you know, uh, on the regular capex, we do not see any major chunk of investments. You know, every year we give a we give a forecast that we you know we would do about 750 crores in during capex plus investments. So we'll we'll come back with you, uh, you know, come back to you possibly in the fourth quarter earning call. You know, that would be more appropriate. Uh, thank you, sir. Wishing all the best. Thank you. We have the next question on the line of Gunjan Pratyani from Bank of America. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks, team, for taking my questions. Most of my questions have been answered. I have very few, uh, very quick follow-ups on the uh, on the margin side. Uh, would it be possible to give us some sense as to you know the 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 170, 180 basis point gross margin improvement that we've seen? Uh, would is it fair to assume that this is bulk of this is coming because of commodity easing? Uh, and you know, do we expect that you know we we can you know similar sort of improvement kicking in in quarter four as well, or bulk of the commodity correction is la is reflected in this uh, Q3? See, uh, Gunjar, it's a you know it's it's a we do have the numbers per se because we do slice and dice it internally. 
But you know what? What I would say is that it has been a conference. You have seen price increases happening in June quarter, September quarter. We did a price increase, uh, I think, in the, again in the third quarter, and then we have announced a price increase. So obviously, you know, we we have got about four four and a half percent of price increase happening, right? Now that's a net price increase. I'm giving some broad numbers. These are not absolute on the dot. The second bit is, of course, steel prices have come off, so that has also kind of helped in the overall, uh, you know, uh, margin improvement. So these are the two large things that have actually helped in the margin improvement. And finally, of course, uh, we have also seen, uh, since you're talking about contribution over material cost, so I will not talk about operating leverage. But uh, the third bit that has happened is being the um, uh, mix of the products, you know, which I've mentioned that the industry is moving towards, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, slightly larger tonnage, which is good for the industry. Okay, and this commodity tailwind will will still sustain going into quarter four is is what I'm like just trying to understand. I, we are hoping that that will happen because it's it's good for the industry. We've had uh, you know I think 2021 20, and uh, 21 22 partially were very tough years uh, for uh, the industry not only because of COVID but also the soaring steel prices that were there, and you know uh, it, it's good to see that prices have softened so. Uh, it's very difficult. It's a, it's a conjecture at this moment mm -hmm. in time whether the reduction that has happened in Q3 will we see the same amount of reduction happening in Q4 further? We don't know. But like I mentioned earlier, we are expecting that uh, prices will continue at least at the you know the exit rate of Q3, which is lower than the entry rate of Q3. So to that extent, okay. there will be some benefit. Okay, got it. The other one was, uh, and um, I may be wrong on this, Leyland Finance. Uh, I mean, I do see some pref allotments there. Is I mean, is that something you know which which you know EL has also participated some color on you know incremental investments if have gone into uh, the finance business? No, actually, uh, just to kind of give a you know brief update on Leyland Finance. Uh, there was a, you know, they had a qualified Q, Q, QIB placement happening for about 910 crores, which was announced. So they are adequate on capital. And, uh, you know, that is uh, in a way for folks who are looking at the Ashok Leyland balance sheet will be positive because there is no demand that will come in from Ashok Leyland for funding mm -hmm. Leyland finance growth plans. They are adequately funded. Uh, I also wanted to share that they have also announced that there will be, uh, you know, a merger with NXT Digital, which is, uh, you know, an, uh, a court-approved process. And uh, mm -hmm. that is also on the way. So, uh, you know, uh, okay. if, with the regulatory approvals and all the necessary shareholder approvals, if they come through, then the outcome would be that uh, Hinduja Leyland Finance will uh, become a listed company. Got it. And lastly, on scrappage, if you can share your thoughts, anything that we should read into the the the, the budget incremental impetus, or you know, any progress on that scheme, do we see that as an industry growth uh, catalyst for for the next you know one or two years? Okay, I'll just quickly give a high. See, we are also waiting for the detail of uh, you know the uh, the budget notification to come in. But uh, what what the government has said is that uh, you know all vehicles uh, you know above 15 years would be scrapped and there's a lot of focus mentioned. Uh, it, it includes pass cars etc. I think uh, if my if I'm not mistaken, the uh, the government representative or is it the honourable minister? I'm not too sure. Had mentioned the potential of nearly about nine lakh units, uh, but that's spread mm -hmm. across vehicles. Okay, it's not. <laughs> Uh, mm. But we believe that, see, this is definitely a positive, like we have been mentioning earlier. Any sort of a policy announcement like scrappage means the government is signaling towards uh, exiting the older vehicles, right? And we we believe that this, this acceleration will happen even faster because of the two changes in technology. You know, we can't have a situation where you have BS2, BS3, BS4, BS6 vehicles all flying together when the government is also committed on the environment side. So like our chairman mentioned, we see two opportunities. One, the replacement cycle should, uh, we could see that because of this scrappage, there'll be some addition to the replacement cycle. The second one is we are also seeing that because of the thrust on the government, including PLI, uh, we are going to see uh, maybe faster adoption of EVs, which is again good for uh, Shokril. And Chairman, uh, mm -hmm. you want to add something? No, I think, uh, Gopal, you've covered it. Uh, we need to see the finer details and uh, I think since a while the government has been talking about this scrappage policy and if there is some form of support that comes in from the center to the state government, I think that will expedite it. 
But uh, if uh, more firmer or more clear directions come on this, it will definitely have a good impact for our industry. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have the next question on the line of Hitesh from CLSA. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. My uh, most of the questions are answered. Just uh, wanted to, uh, you know, touch base more on this scrappage policy. Do you, do you, uh, uh, do you guys are also setting up scrappage centers, uh, or you're looking at doing that uh, in anticipation of this policy? Because I think this, is, like you said, there's a lot of focus from the government uh, on this, and maybe post elections, you, we could see something on this front. So, have the government, you know, started uh, talking to industry on scrappage centers? Chairman, would you want to take that? Sure. Uh, we have, of course, been considering this since a while. We've explored uh, the contours of what this would involve, but we have not uh, gone into any uh, capex mode at this point of time, just waiting for the finer details to be announced. Uh, and then once, once we know exactly what this would entail, uh, we would be able to fine-tune our investments accordingly. Okay. Uh, so I just wanted to ask a second question. Gopal, you said that, um, you know, the freight rates have kind of softened. I think Mr. Hinduja said that after the festive season. So why has that happened? Because when I see the, there's some slowdown in consumption for sure, but when I see the e-way bill data, that is growing pretty rapidly. So truck utilization should not have come off. So can you shed some more light on this? Is it more seasonal or you're seeing softness in freight rates? Going ahead as well. I, I, I don't think, uh, I think what you mentioned was more an overall overarching, uh, you know, kind of view of what is happening in the industry. Uh, that is uh, certainly not a trend. And I think uh, we should see that, that uh, we don't see any major impacts on freight rates. And we have no data to state that, you know, freight rates will soften further. Chairman, would you want to add something? No, I think you're right. I mean, you know, what I said is uh, the, the viability of fleet, fleet operators remains healthy. Although there has been some moderation in this uh, trade rates during this festive season, but I think going forward is uh, the way the market is moving. I do not see uh, softening within on the freight rates to happen. Yeah, great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Indira. Thank you, Arpan. Yeah. Thank you. We have the next question on the line of Chirag Shah from Novama. Please go ahead. Mr. Shah, can you hear us? Yeah, hello. Thanks for the opportunity. So I have two questions. The first question is on market share. Uh, if you can elaborate a little bit, uh, is it coming from because bonds back in a traditional strong markets, or the gain is largely coming from non south markets where we have been making more uh, inroads? Well, uh, Chirag, we have, uh, yeah. go ahead, Chairman. Please go ahead. Please go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, uh, as I mentioned, our market share growth has come across the country. In fact, uh, we've had a stronger growth in the north and east in terms of the overall percentage. And we see, uh, I mean, it, it has been due to the increase in the expansion of our network, but also as Gopal has been explaining as well, there's been a strong product pull, uh, which has also helped us. So it is not only a southern market uh, growth, but it is an all India growth that we've seen. Uh, the western markets, uh, north, east, central, uh, across the board. Oh, this is helpful. The second question was on uh, uh, on the nature of demand again. Uh, so I am getting some conflicting reports which indicate that small drug operators, slash first time operators, are still not coming to buy. They are still trying to use the uh, replace vehicle and older vehicle and the demand is coming largely from uh, medium and large fleet operators. Is this, is this information correct or you are already seeing some influx coming from small truck operators also? Well, I think you do. Uh, fleets today, if I'm not wrong, comprise anywhere between 60 to 70 percent of the overall industry volume. And what we're also seeing is that uh, the smaller operators in some way are getting tied up with the fleets as well. And uh, we are seeing a lot of purchases from the first time users as well. Of course, from a quantum perspective, fleets buy in you know, 50s or hundreds of units. 
But I would say that uh, we actually see the, uh, the demand coming from all segments. It's not only restricted to the uh, fleet operators. Yeah, and just a clarification, you indicated that uh, at least for Q4, the commodity benefit is going to be similar or maybe a little bit soft, right? So is it a large part of the benefits has come through and then how Q1 would play out would depend upon how the prices behave from here on? Is it the right way to understand on the commodity baskets? Uh, Gopal, you want to yeah. respond to that? Yeah, you see, you, you are asking a very uh, tough question and asking us to peer into the crystal ball. Uh, we'll have to really wait and watch how the commodity plays out, right? I mean, uh, even after the, you, you know, initially for a day or two or three, it was actually when the export duty was removed on steel, for example, there was a perception that steel prices will harden, but they haven't because the, the, the point is that the Indian prices still continue to be uh, higher than the global prices. So, at, at, at the moment, all we can see is visibility till fourth, fourth quarter. And if in the fourth quarter, uh, the commodity prices continue to be at the third quarter level or at the exit level, as we, you know, kind of believe it will be, uh, then it would uh, it would have a, you know, a, a positive impact. Uh, of course, if it falls even further, then it has a greater impact. But these are all imponderables at this moment, you know, but we haven't seen... All we can say at the moment is, uh, you know, sitting on the 2nd of February, we haven't seen a further decrease happening in commodity, but neither has there been any increase. So at the moment, it looks like it is at, uh, you know, the third quarter levels. The 1st of uh, April, I mean, uh, in Q1 of next year, we'll have to really wait and watch to see what happens in, uh, you know, the global commodity markets, because it's not just about Indian commodity, right? It, it, a lot of things is going to depend on the global uh, demand supply condition also. So we'll have to take, you know, cross the bridge when it comes then. And we have a kind of a quarter lag, right, for the impact to flow through for us? Yeah, in a way, yes, because of two reasons. There is, uh, you know, there is uh, inventory as well, right? I mean, so yeah. we are seeing that benefit. So there is FG inventory, there is uh, RM and WIP, which is there. Uh, then, uh, so when, you know, that needs to get used in. And then typically the industry also doesn't settle on a month on month, you know, the steel price and you know, the steel industry, these are uh, done on a quarterly basis. So we have to really kind of uh, have uh, actively engaged with them to actually settle these prices. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Paul. Thank you. We have the next question on the line of Arvind Sharma from City. Please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon, sir, <clears throat> and thank you for taking my question. So just uh, one question on the net debt. If you could uh, just explain how it has progressed from last year end, uh, essentially the free cash flow generation, CAPEX, and how the net debt has progressed over last three quarters. Thank you, sir. Yeah, our, uh, you know, our net debt now is uh, about 2,000. Just give me a moment. Uh, I have the number. No, so our net debt is 2,043 crore, and uh, I think in Q3 of FY22, uh, last year it was 2,697. I think the number was almost the same, 2,677 in Q, the Q2 of FY23. Also, the capex is roughly about 346, 350 crores. So, you know, we are, uh, we, I, th I think we are well on track. You know that we are pretty conservative on the cap. I mean, we are tight, not conservative. We are pretty tight on the capex, and there is multiple levels of uh, discussions before we spend money on that. And uh, overall, if you look at it, uh, you know, the, the net debt levels have been, uh, you know, kind of uh, improving, and we don't see an issue on that. I mean, I don't know whether you had any specific question on that. Uh, no, sir. And uh, would you have any, um, you know, since you have some idea about the capex in the fourth quarter, uh, Anything, any idea about where we could end up fiscal 23 at? Because, uh, I mean, the EBITDA margin is expected to be better given the volume. So uh, do you think that this could, um, this could improve significantly over the next quarter? So you see, uh, as I mentioned, I stand corrected on that. It's not 343, it's 321, right? So the CapEx was 321. We had, at the beginning of the year, if my memory serves me right, we had said that it will be around 750, maybe we'll end up with 600. All I can tell you at this moment is, you know, we have a two months two month, uh, more left. Uh, you know, it should be lower than 600, definitely. 
maybe we will even peg it a little lower than that, but we'll share that. So all I can tell you is that it's not a material amount of capex that we have today in the current sure. house. Sure. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks. That's all from my side. <coughs> Thank you. We have the next question from the line of Jinesh Gandhi from Motilal as well. Please go ahead. <laughs> Uh, hi, uh, my question pertains to the CAPEX itself. I mean, given that we are expecting a strong growth uh, to continue in FY24 and uh, given our uh, other investment programs, uh, do, do, uh, should we look at uh, increase in pace of investment going forward for the future growth, uh, both on product and capacity side? Chairman, would you want to take that? I would, uh, yeah, sure. I think, you know, on the capacity side, we are, as Gopal was saying, we are looking at all the internal efficiencies that we can uh, bring in, de-bottlenecking within the plants wherever there are possibilities. So based on the current volume uh, that we're foreseeing, I think we should be able to uh, manage with the capacity that's on ground. We do not want to get into uh, creating more overheads at this point of time. Uh, with regard to the product, as you recall, the introduction of Aftar as a modular platform, the benefit of it is that with very minor modifications, we are able to meet whatever the customer requirements are and in alternate fuels as well. So, you know, moving to whether it's CNG, uh, hydrogen, LNG. And I think that's the benefit of the Upstar platform. That was the high capex that we went through. There are certain product categories that we are not currently present in, and we would be uh, looking into, uh, you know, filling up any uh, gaps that we have in the portfolio. But at this point of time, uh, I think we are not seeing anything substantial uh, to hit our capex requirements. Okay, okay. And just to clarify, uh, the investment on the electric uh, vehicle products, uh, particularly on the LCV side, will be done through Ashok Leland uh, and not through Switch. Is that correct? No. the elect All the uh, products coming out of Switch, the CapEx, will be borne by Switch directly. And uh, so, of course, there is a... There is a agreement between Ashok Leland and Switch based on which these products would be utilized, but all the CapEx required for the electrification would be borne by Switch directly. Oh, so even the Badados EV would be invested by, product investment would be at Switch level, not at Leden level? That's right. Got it, got it. Uh, great. Thanks and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. We have the next question, the line of Mukesh Saraf from Eventless Park. Please go ahead. Good uh, uh, afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity. <clears throat> Just the one question from my side on the uh, fleet operators. Uh, what we are hearing from large ones uh, such as VRN uh, is that um, the smaller and more unorganized fleet operators are losing out. Uh, uh, so the question here is, uh, what does this mean for, for us? I mean, uh, do we see the product mix probably shift towards <clears throat> uh, uh, larger trucks or maybe even fully loaded trucks. Um, and uh, on the other side, does it also mean that the pricing uh, gets a lot more competitive uh, given that the large operators might uh, bargain harder? So <clears throat> how, how does this play out for us? I think, you know, from a product segment perspective, uh, irrespective of the buyers, whether it's first-time users or whether it's fleet operators, what we see is that there is a clear segmentation on the delivery models that people require. So right from an LCV, ICV yeah. is still remaining the larger uh, segment of the market. And so, you know, looking at a fleet between 9 to 18 ton or a product range between 9 to 18 ton still is a very large uh, segment. So while uh, we're looking at the whole distribution cycle, the last mile delivery to the long distance that's needed uh, across the country. I think we will continuously see uh, all the different product categories are growing based on the market demand. And uh, mm -hmm. on the, yeah, sorry, what was the second part of your question? 
Uh, so it was it was basically uh, when you deal with say larger operators, uh, would it also mean that uh, you don't get that much of a pricing power with them? Well, I think a lot of it also depends on the demand itself, and today the demand remains very strong, and uh, the competitiveness of our uh, of our of the other OEMs as well, how they are pricing. But uh, right. as we are seeing currently. Uh, the prices, we are improving realization based on the current demand requirements. So I'm not seeing any uh, decline or reduction in terms of our ability to price our products. All right, sure, sure. Thank you. That's about it from my side. Hello. Hello. That was the last question. I would now like to hand it over to the management for closing comments. Uh, thank you, and thank you for your interest in Ashok Leyland. And I think, as we mentioned, we've had a good quarter. We're seeing this uh, trend to continue. Uh, the government's uh, commitment towards their capex and possibly the scrappage scheme introduction as well all hold good promise for our sector and uh, we have grown our market share in the last few quarters and we continue to do so and uh, this is uh, across the country market share growth and across the various product segments as well including the passenger vehicle side so all in all we remain uh, very upbeat in terms of the prospects for this industry and for ashok and as a whole uh, Gopal, would you like to add anything further? No, uh, I think you kind of wrapped it up, uh, Chairman. So, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, we we hope that, you know, we are able to continue with the performance and the, uh, the macroeconomic factors continue to support uh, the growth of the industry. And, uh, you know, we'll have more to share in the fourth quarter. Thank you very much. Thank you.